Okay, thank you all for coming to today's seminar. It is really my pleasure to introduce our fuel science seminar speaker today, Dr. Shabaji Sirkar. Uh, he comes to us from Air Products and Chemicals Incorporated in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, where he's been for the past 23 years in research and development. Um, prior to that, he was a postdoctoral scholar, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, that's where also he got his PhD in chemical engineering in 1970. During his employment at Air Products, uh, his research has involved uh, gas and liquid separations by adsorption, and he's also the inventor of numerous gas separation processes, five of which I found out have been commercialized by Air Products, which seems to me to be a, an excellent measure of someone's success in industry. Um, he will be discussing one of those, I believe, today, uh, the, the one that you said is <laughs> sort of in the commercialization. Some commercialization. Yes. Uh, his research interests are quite broad, as some of you found out, encompassing thermodynamics, kinetics, uh, process development, uh, mathematical modeling, and material development as they relate to surface phenomena and adsorption. Uh, his experience also includes the design and operation of bench and pilot scale uh, equipment, also for uh, process and material testing, process optimization, and scale-up. He is the author of 43 U.S. patents, 65 international patents, and 115 scientific publications. Uh, Dr. Sirkar is a member of ACS, uh, AICHE, and in fact that latter organization awarded him the Professional Progress Award in 1988. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sirkar, who will be speaking on nanoporous carbon membranes for separation of gas mixtures. Thank you, Bob. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, thanking you for inviting me here and give the opportunity to <coughs> present one of our recent works. Uh, Bob mentioned this is a commercial thing. It's not commercial yet. It's being tested in field, and we hope in another year or so this will become pretty commercial. What we're talking about today is a, a new class of membranes, a new class of microporous and nanoporous membrane for gas separation and it uses a concept called selective surface flow. And I'll describe that as we go into that. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about microporous membranes a little bit. Uh, as you all know that polymeric membranes using the mechanism of uh, uh, solution diffusion have been exploited quite extensively over the last 30 years for gas separation and purification. Use of microporous membranes for gas separation has been relatively new in the last oh, 10 years or so, uh, 15 years or so. And uh, the four mechanisms have been identified for this, uh, for the separation using uh, microporous membrane. The oldest is, of course, Knudsen diffusion that goes back, way back. Uh, it uses the difference in the molecular weights of gas components uh, by Knudsen flow through a pore of maybe 1,000 angstrom or so in diameter. Multa sieving is another one, which is really developed by two people named Kores and Sophia in Israel. They have made carbon fibers, which are, oh, somewhere between 5 to 8 angstrom in diameter, or maybe smaller, 4 to 8 angstrom in diameter, and it separates on the basis of size of the molecule. The smaller molecule goes through the pore, and the larger molecule stays behind. So that's the me me mechanism of uh, separation, and that's why it's called molecular sieving. Although you don't get infinite selectivity, the typically the idea is that the smaller molecule goes through faster through the membrane than the larger molecule, although, it, although the larger molecule does also go through it at some rate. The third kind is also relatively new. It's selective condensation in pores, and some Japanese authors have been developing that. If you have a mesoporous solid, like a 200 angstrom or larger pore size, and if you pass a gas mixture containing a condensable component, the condensable component uh, condenses in the pore by the Kelvin equation, by uh, uh, capillary condensation, and then it diffuses across the pore, while the non-condensable gas components are completely blocked off. So you can get a very high selectivity by that technique. The problem is that there's a limit how much you can, how much separation you can achieve by that because the ultimate gas phase composition is dictated <laughs> by the Kelvin vapor pressure. 
so you cannot go beyond a certain vapor pressure or certain composition the gas phase. And the last kind <coughs> is selective surface flow, which was also been around quite, a, quite some time. Professor Barrer at Imperial College published a bunch of papers in 50s talking about selective surface flow, and then uh, in 60s and 70s, a whole bunch of papers demonstrating the selective surface flow. But what he did, he used a plug of non-porous carbon, like carbon black, to demonstrate this concept. Nobody, to our best knowledge, have been able to use that concept to uh, produce a practical membrane which gives separation by selective surface flow, and that's what we have done. This is, is this focused? Or I guess so. Consider, this, is, this gives the mechanism of uh, gas separation by selective surface flow. Consider a thin layer of a nanoporous uh, material like carbon, it could be also inorganic material, supported on a porous support. And let's assume this is one single pore, this is a cartoon of a single pore in that nanoporous layer. If you pass a gas mixture, and let's assume hydrogen, hydrocarbon mixture through here, this pore size is roughly uh, 5 to 7 angstrom in diameter. The hydrocarbon molecules, which are these yellow ones, are adsorbed selectively over hydrogen which are the blue ones. And the adsorbed molecule moves from the high pressure side to the low pressure side because there's a chemical potential driving force. The desorb on the low pressure side to the gas phase. So there's a selective adsorption of the high, larger hydrocarbon molecules or more polar molecules in case of polar, non-polar gas mixture, which prevents the selective adsorption or adsorption of the smaller molecules or the less polar molecules on the surface. That gives you the selectivity. Adsorptive selectivity and selective surface diffusion that gives the mechanism for separation. If something else happens, if the spore is small enough, the adsorbed molecule blocks off the void space between the uh, adsorbed molecules and prevents the flow of the smaller molecule through there. There's a hindered uh, diffusion or hindered diffusion of the smaller molecules through the void space. So you have selective adsorption, selective surface flow, and hindered diffusion of the smaller molecules. All three together gives you the selectivity for this kind of a this kind of a membrane or this kind of a mechanism. I think I have uh, uh, repeating some of these things, but the point that the key me key requirement is that the selectively permeating molecule adsorbs from the hydrogen side. Now, if you have a favorable adsorption isotherm, you can adsorb quite a bit of that at a very low pressure. And therefore, you do not need a very large pressure on the high pressure side to make this membrane work, as opposed to a polymeric membrane, where you need a very large pressure in the high pressure side to dissolve the gas into the membrane matrix. So this can operate at a very uh, relatively low pressure on the high pressure side, like maybe uh, uh, one and a half bar, two bar is sufficient. In a polymeric matrix, you might need 60 bar, 80 bar, or what have you. Uh, the smaller or less strongly adsorbed components are produced at the feed pressure. For my hydrogen hydrocarbon example, hydrogen passes through the membrane, hydrocarbon stays behind, which is the smaller molecule. Very often, that's the desired product. So you are producing the, a gas stream enriched in the smaller molecule at the high pressure. In most polymeric membranes, it's just the opposite. The hydrogen will go through and it will be produced at low pressure, and you have to recompress it, and that compression cost is very, very expensive. So this is one of the major uh, attractions of this membrane. And the third one is that in case of a carbon membrane, or even for an inorganic membrane, you can play with the surface quite a bit. You can make it more polar, less polar. You can make the pores slightly bigger, slightly smaller. So there's a lot of molecular engineering you can do on the surface to make it more selective or less selective to a certain company. There's an infinite amount of research you can do or development you can do on these kinds of membranes, which may not be possible with a, let's say, molecular sieving membrane, where slightly bigger size of the hole completely destroys the membrane. Uh, the energy barrier for surface diffusion is typically much less than the energy barrier for movement of gases through polymeric matrix. 
and therefore you can get a very high permeation rate through this SSF membranes, selective surface flow membranes, compared to polymeric membranes. And yet you retain the high selectivity because of the mechanism of transport. So you can get high selectivity as well as high permeation rate through these membranes, which is a problem with polymeric membrane where as the selectivity goes up, the permeation rate goes down. Since the permeation rate is higher, and this the diffusivity of a gas through these kinds of membranes is maybe uh, 100 to uh, 100,000 times faster than that through a polymeric membrane. So it diffuses very fast, and therefore you don't need a very thin membrane. A micron size thickness is acceptable. In a typical polymeric membrane, you need submicron layer of active polymeric uh, membrane layer, uh, like maybe uh, well, 300 angstrom, 500 angstrom, tenth of an angstrom, tenth of a micron kind of thing. You don't need a very thin layer, which means they are more stable, they don't break and all that. And I described the selectivity, this is just to repeat. We get selective adsorption, selective surface flow, and hindered gas phase diffusion, which gives you the selectivity. All that's fine. Uh, <coughs> there are certain requirements for making this membrane to be practical. One is, I said, it can be thin, but thin one to five micron. We can't have it, you know, uh, 10 centimeters there. We have to have this force across this membrane continuous. You can't have blocked force because that defeats the purpose. If the gas gets in and has no place to go, it just, that pole is dead. This is the most important point. These pores have to be truly nanoporous. They have to be less than 10 angstrom in diameter. Because if these membranes are too big, like 12, 15 angstrom in diameter, it's like a hole. And their void space flow between the absorbed layers will be too large and you lose complete selectivity. So the pores have to be very, very small. And the pore distribution has to be very uniform. That's the key, key requirement. And of course, it has to be supported on something to give strength. Let me go back to this one, this uh, point, and uh, illustrate that in more detail. What I have got here is diffusivity in log scale of methane as a function of pore diameter in angstrom. When the pore diameter is above 1,000 angstrom, this is uh, pore diameter in angstrom. When the pore diameter is above 1,000 angstrom, the main uh, mechanism of flow is bulk diffusion. Between uh, 20 angstrom and 1,000 angstrom, the dominant mechanism of flow is nodes and diffusion. There's a transition in here. But below 20 angstrom, look what happens. The diffusivity decreases uh, double exponentially, or what have you, with the change in pore diameter. 0.2 angstrom difference in pore diameter in this way changes the diffusivity <coughs> by two to three orders of magnitude. So if you are talking about 6 angstrom pore or 7 angstrom pore, the diffusivity difference is probably by the three orders of magnitude. Okay? You have to have these pores really precise and very small. This is called the activated diffusion, configuration diffusion and all that. Now, this transition is not studied at all. The transition from Knudsen diffusion to activated diffusion is absolutely uh, unknown. There's not one single paper which talks about that transition. Okay. Now, we got these data points from uh, published lit literature data for diffusion of methane through zeolite structures, zeolite crystals, which are very well uh, characterized. <coughs> okay. uh, and these were calculated by standard equations. So the key point here is that you've got to have the pore size right and not with large distribution because in that case, this membrane will not work. And I'm uh, happy to tell you that we have come up with a technique to do that. Very narrow pore size distribution and very small pores. What we do is uh, take a layer of polyvinylene chloride, latex, put it on some side of a support. Now, originally we used graphite but these days we're using alumina, and then uh, dry it in air, and then carbonize under nitrogen at in this kind of temperature range. And the heating rate and cooling rate are critical. 
what happens is PPDC is turned into a uh, carbon matrix. They, they uh, carbonize and, and uh, uh, cross-link. And we may have to do it more than once to get the right membrane. But heating rate, cooling rate, uh, and holding at what, uh, what temperature at which you hold this for a certain period of time, those are critical variables. Typically, we get a uh, film, carbon film, which is one to three microns in thickness by doing this. Okay, now, let me go through some data now. The way we measure diffusivity of pure gases through this membrane is using this kind of an apparatus, which is standard. This is a Vicky uh, uh, Kallenbach type of apparatus. You have a high pressure side, a low pressure side, and a membrane sits in the middle. We flow a gas, pure gas, through this and goes out this way. And we collect the permeated gas in an evacuated vessel and monitor the pressure change <coughs> of that vessel. And knowing the volumes, etc., I can calculate how much gas is permeating as a function of time. Now, the diffusivity that I'm going to talk about, or permeability I'm going to talk about, is defined this way. The flux through the membrane, or this is the total flow through the membrane, is uh, permeability divided by the thickness of the membrane, area of the membrane, and partial pressure in the high pressure side minus partial pressure in the low, low pressure side. This is how it is defined, nothing else. And this ratio is called permeance. Uh, permeability over thick, uh, thickness is called permeance in the membrane lingo. For the batch experiment, uh, signal compound experiment, the flux is proportional to the pressure rise in the bomb, to the volume of the bomb, and temperature and gas constant. If we integrate that with the def definition of diffusivity or permeance, we, we get this equation. What this shows that if you plot this quantity against a, an arbitrary time scale here, you should get a linear line with uh, this as slope, and the permeance is uh, proportional to that slope. Now, this T star is a time, it takes some time before a steady state is achieved. You bring in the gas at high pressure over the membrane, and it takes a little bit of time before that pressure becomes steady, and that time is T star. This is just your arbitrary reference time. These are some examples of that linearness of that plot. That's that quantity we calculate against time, and this is called ethane and hydrogen, that tail rock straight, straight lines. And, we, and the, from the slope of that, we can calculate the permeance of these gases, pure gases, through the membrane. Now, for a mixture, the experiment is a little more tricky. We do a countercurrent flow. We flow the gas mixture through the high pressure side at some constant pressure, and it is a sweep gas at the low pressure side at some constant pressure. We measure the flow rates in and out, in and out, compositions in and out, and then define a log mean delta P, which is a standard chemical engineering jargon to describe the driving force for mixture, and we can, by measuring those quantities, we can calculate the permeance from the mixture, okay? <coughs> now, here is some important properties. These are pure gas perme permeabilities for hydrogen, methane, C286, propane, and butane through this membrane. Uh, as we go up on the hydrocarbons from hydrogen to methane to ethane, the permeance goes up because we have more adsorption of methane than hydrogen, more adsorption of ethane than methane. So the driving force across the membrane is increased. More adsorption, more driving force. But as you climb up on the, on the, on the homologous series, the total permeance goes down. Adsorption is still going up, but it is held more tightly, and therefore surface diffusion goes down. This permeance is sort of a product between amount adsorbed and the surface diffusivity. So what is happening going up here, amount adsorbed goes up, therefore permeance goes up. And here, amount adsorbed still is going up, but the surface diffusivity is going down because they are held more tightly. So this is very interesting phenomena that the permeance goes to a maximum for these membranes. Now, for a polymeric membrane, the ratio of these permeabilities is the selectivity of separation. And these are the ratios for this membrane, a hydrocarbon divided by hydrogen. And for polymeric membrane, as I said, for example, uh, propane hydrogen selectivity will be only 2.2. That's not much. There's nothing to write home about. 
But that's not how this membrane operates. These permeabilities will be totally different when you put a gas mixture because larger molecules will selectively adsorb over hydrogen and, and, and completely block it off. And my next slide shows those data. These are the data for uh, permeation data <coughs> for gas, high component gas mixture and the composition is given here. Look, what happens, <coughs> the hydrogen permeability is only 1.2, but the pure gas hydrogen permeability was 129. So in presence of butane, which selectively adsorbed, hydrogen adsorption was completely blocked and its permeance is reduced. Same thing in methane. Now, as in this mixture, butane is the most strongly adsorbed component, so it moves, uh, its permeability is the highest and not very different from the pure component permeability. The others are giving some competition with, uh, against it. But when butane is removed, propane will be the most strongly adsorbed component, and this number will become something like uh, 80 or so. Okay? When ethane is gone, I mean propane is gone, ethane is the most strongly adsorbed component, and this number will jump up to something like 20. So what is happening is the most strongly adsorbed component diffuses first through the membrane, followed by the next strongly adsorbed, and so on. So you can use this kind of a membrane as sort of a chromatographic separation cut. You can cut a methane, a butane-rich layer, a butane-rich cut, propane-rich cut, and so on. Okay. Uh, this clearly demonstrates this effect of selective surface adsorption and diffusion. Okay. Uh, what we found out, we have tested this uh, membrane for many, many gas mixtures, and what we found out that one of the uh, good way to have used this membrane is to separate hydrogen from hydrocarbons. The selectivity between hydrogen and hydrocarbons you can see here, uh, 120 for butane, <coughs> propane hydrogen is 24, ethane hydrogen is 7.2, so it will be a good membrane to separate hydrogen and hydrocarbon mixtures. Let's talk about a little bit about hydrogen market. I'll just read these things, these are statistics. Seven billion cubic feet a day of hydrogen is produced in the US today, okay? The growth rate is about 1,000 billion, uh, 1 billion cubic feet a day. The sad part is that about 800 million cubic feet a day of hydrogen is wasted as fuel of this seven billion. Uh, roughly 10, how many, 12%. This is hydrogen after use is contaminated with some garbage, and then it is burned. It has a pretty high value. And the reason it is burned because there's no economic way to recover it today. The typical waste gas would have 20 to 50 percent hydrogen and balances C1 to C4 hydrocarbons. It's a reasonably low pressure, like 30 to 150 pounds. Now, currently we're burning it to make steam. We produce a lot of excess steam. Sometimes there's no market for that and also hydrogen combustion produces mass. <coughs> this is a good source of hydrogen if we can develop an economic way to recover it. And this is where our selective surface flow membrane comes in. Well, we could use con conventional pressure stream adsorption to purify that hydrogen. Uh, but you need a pressure of 200 to 300 pounds to run them, so you have to compress that waste gas. And second thing is that you need at least 40% hydrogen to run a PSA. Some of these streams have 25, 30% hydrogen and they're not amenable to PSA. You couldn't use polybenic membranes because those gases are at a very low pressure. You have to compress it to fairly large pressure before you could use a polymeric membrane to clean them. And that again is not possible. So really there is no viable uh, technology for removing or recovering low pressure dilute hydrogen from a waste gas stream. And this SSF membrane looks very good uh, for that. This is an example. What we want, our goal is to produce a high purity hydrogen uh, from a waste gas. This is a typical refinery waste gas at low pressure. And we like to produce very high purity hydrogen. Now, the SSF membrane uh, only enriches the hydrogen. Like, it does not produce pure hydrogen. You go from 30 to 60% or 40 to 70% like that. So it has to be a hybrid, hybrid process. So what we are doing, take the SSF membrane and bridge the hydrogen from this low purity to maybe some medium purity. Now it becomes amenable to PSA. So we combine SSF membrane with PSA to produce pure hydrogen. And I'll give you an example. These are actual data. Oh, 
This is one equipment we had among many others where we tested multi-component gas formation. This is a plate and frame type of arrangement with one, two, three, four, five, six sheets of membrane. And this is continuously run, multi-component gas goes in, enriched hydrogen comes out, first gas comes in, and enriched hydrocarbon gas comes out, and we measure the pressure temperature. This is run for months to get steady state data, good data. And uh, here's an example. This is the same gas that I described to you before. It's a typical refinery waste gas at low pressure. We flow it over the membrane to increase the hydrogen composition from 41% to 56%. Okay? But in doing so, we have rejected 100% of butane, 91% of propane, 70% or 67% of ethane, and 36% of methane in this system. So this gas is butane free with very little propane. That's an enormous advantage because if you take this gas and put to a hydrogen PSA system where it operates, where it selectively adsorbs the impurities and produces the hydrogen, you can't use this kind of gas with high propane or high butane because they do not dissolve from the PSA system. So you've got to clean up this gas before it can go here. Okay? So we take that gas, compress it to the PSA pressure of 18 bar, produce pure hydrogen, and the waste from the PSA uh, is used as purge there. And this is what we are testing out in a refinery now, uh, working pretty good for the last three months or so. We are producing these membranes now in a modular form on alumina substrate, alumina tubes substrate. Okay. Now, we have done extensive study of uh, the effect of various process variables for these membranes, and I'm going to give you a very brief summary and some puzzles. Coarse temperature is very critical, this adsorption process. Higher the temperature, lower is the adsorption, lower is the driving force. The membrane does not perform as well as a higher temperature. On the other hand, it does perform very well at, at lower temperature. Uh, field gas pressure, composition, flow rate, sweep gas pressure, composition, flow rate. Uh, and the key performance variables are, in this case, is hydrogen recovery. How much of hydrogen is recovered? How, many, how much of hydrocarbons is rejected? Membrane area per unit amount of feed gas. And what is the high pressure effluent composition? The hydrogen enriched gas composition. Because if that gas contains C3, C4, it's worthless. You can't separate it any farther by PSA, let's say. And here's some examples. This is the <coughs> effect of gas phase pressure. What you did is ran, run the system at different pressure levels at the high pressure side of the membrane, same pressure on the low pressure side, same sweep to feed ratio. And what you find out, and these are the hydrocarbon rejections, hydrogen recovery, that as the pressure is increased, the driving force, chemical potential driving force is increased, and you get better rejections. Like, for example, take propane, it goes from 19 to 57 to 73 to 90 percent when you increase the feed gas pressure by. Uh, this amount. This is still not very high pressure. Five bar pressure is not very high pressure. I mean, to do this kind of a separation using a solvent, using a, mem if a polymeric membrane, you need a uh, pressure of something like uh, 40 bar there. So it's still very low pressure, and that's one of the biggest attraction of this membrane. You can run it at a low pressure. This is another interesting thing we found, is that if we, instead of using uh, uh, hydrogen as sweet gas, if we use methane as sweet gas, the rejections go up. Uh, we really don't have an explanation for that. We have tried many, very hard to figure out exactly what happened. We really don't know. But this is a fact that if we use methane sweep instead of hydrogen sweep, we get better separation. Now, one possible thinking is that some of the methane is absorbed at the low pressure side, which, which uh, increases the which decreases the adsorption of other components there and increases the driving force. But we cannot quantify that. It's interesting observation. Here's another example. This is also very attractive. Uh, the conventional way to make hydrogen in the chemical industry today, and this is the state of the art, is to react methane and steam in a steam methane reformer. And what you get is a mixture of CO2, CO, hydrogen, uh, methane, and separate in a pressure strain absorption. 
Okay. Uh, this is the typical composition of, no, I'm sorry. Now the pressure swing adsorption produces high purity hydrogen, like this. And the waste gas from PSA is something like this. Okay. There's a lot of hydrogen left there. And it's at low pressure. Okay. This is a good candidate for our SSF membrane. Uh, this is the conventional way to make hydrogen, as I described. You take steam methane deformation product, and this composition <coughs> goes through hydrogen pressure swing adsorption <coughs> process to produce a very high purity hydrogen product with about 80% hydrogen carbon from feed. And this is that waste gas, okay? 20% of the hydrogen from the feed is wasted here. So what do you do is stick in a, a self membrane here in this waste gas. And it's at low pressure, so fine, it will operate. Enrich the hydrogen and recycle it to improve the overall hydrogen recovery. And this pays off very well. The original process had a hydrogen recovery of 80%, and just by sticking this in, you improve the hydrogen recovery to 90%. Okay? It's a big number. A typical hydrogen plant today is produces 20 million cubic feet a day hydrogen by this route. Hydrogen is allowed. And hydrogen is $2 per thousand cubic feet. So you calculate 10% increase in recovery, how much money that is. This thing will pay off in one or two years. We're dealing with very large volumes of gas. Okay. So summarizing that part of the talk, we can get good recovery of hydrogen from a low pressure, low hydrogen purity waste gas, which could not be handled before. What we are doing is turning a waste hydrogen into a high value, high purity chemical. Okay. Of course, there's the side benefit of NOx emission, because uh, uh, if you burn hydrogen, you get NOx. And we had to put this thing in because we got DOE money for that. Uh, and and the conventional separation methods are not economic, okay? And we'd like to thank, I, I was joking, I'd like, like to thank the LGDOE for uh, providing a, a decent uh, support for this project for scale up, for the scale up one. Okay, let me now go into a little bit of science of this. <laughs> characterization of this, whole characterization of this membrane. And, uh, well, we'll see what it is. Several years back, Maud and I, Madhuka Rao is my co-worker, and I, we were measuring hydrogen and helium diffusivities or permeabilities of uh, hydrogen and helium permeabilities through these carbon membranes. And what we found, and this is really what struck us that we have something in our hand, what we found is that the ratio of the permeabilities is four to five, or four to five and a half. For nooks and diffusion, the ratio has to be 1.414 square root of the molecular weights. And right there we knew that we have got something which is really strange or something different. Secondly, uh, the diffusivity ratio was a function of temperature. Again, for uh, Knudsen diffusion, it should be a function of temperature only uh, by square root of square root of temperature. And this is more like more or less like an exponential function. So we figured out that hydrogen and helium Diffusion through these membranes are activated diffusion. They're both non adsorbing gas, very weakly adsorbing gas. So that was the eye opener, and this happened several years back. And then we started really geared up work on this thing. Now, <coughs> this is that diagram I showed you before. This is the methane diffusivity as a function of pore size. And we measured pure methane diffusivity through this carbon, and we got a diffusivity of 10 to the minus 5 or so. And the pore size, according to that, is about, I think it's between five and six angstrom. So that's the indirect proof that this membrane has a pore opening somewhere between five and six angstrom. That's not good enough, because I told you two tenths of an angstrom difference makes a large difference in the diffusivity. This is a similar plot for nitrogen, not methane. And again, we get a number like five to six angstrom. So they're very consistent. Not good enough. Okay, so what then we did was take that methane diffusivity plot, curve fitted with the equation, we actually need two equations to, dis yeah, to describe it mathematically, and the solid line describes the fit, and then imposed 
a gamma distribution of four sides on that diffusivity curve to calculate an average diffusivity for a, for a given distribution. We assume a gamma distribution, we assume that the distribution of force is given by a gamma distribution, okay, and use that to calculate an average diffusivity, which is measured here, to find out what kind of a pore size distribution we have. And what we found out is very interesting. This is a plot, I won't go into detail, diffusivity for methane against this quantity. This is a variance square divided by mean square of the pore size distribution. And these are lines with, with given mean four sides, like four angstrom, five angstrom, six angstrom, eight angstrom. And our measured diffusivity was here. So this shows that we can't have force greater than six angstrom mean. And only certain combinations of variance and mean will give me that diffusivity, and that's listed here. For example, if the mean was 5.5, the variance will be 0.59, or the force will be between 3.9 and 7. So again, we're saying four to seven, five to seven kind of number. These are all indirect methods. These are not direct methods. And what this told us is that the, diffuse, the pore size distribution is very, very narrow. Because if you have 10 angstrom pores, and even 0.5% uh, of the pores are 10 angstrom, you won't see this separation. This is like a hole. All right? Then we tried, oh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of that uh, membrane. This is one of the membranes and where we had put five layers, five cores. This is one, two, three, four, five. Each one is about half micron in thickness. And at this magnification is 20,000. Uh, this is a micron. We could not see any cracks or fissures or large pores. So that is good news. This is an atomic force micrograph of this membrane surface. We thought that we will directly see these pores. But what we saw is this. This is a 60 angstrom by 60 angstrom randomly chosen surface on the membrane. And what you're seeing is the surface roughness. This roughness is about 2, two angstrom in height. So if you're trying to measure 5 angstrom pore with 2 angstrom height roughness, you cannot measure it. The size of the roughness is equal to the size of the dimension of the roughness is equal to the dimension of the pore. So this AFM was not really good. We tried to polish this thing and didn't solve that problem. It got worse, actually. Okay. Anyway, th this is a cross-section scan of that 60 by 60 angstrom uh, area by AFM. And this is what you get. Again, you see the surface roughness. If we assume that one of these depths is a pore, this is an assumption, this distance between uh, this distance is uh, is uh, 5.2 uh, angstrom. So again, I don't know whether that's a pore or not, but it's by the kind of size you're seeing is four to five to six that kind of number. The most uh, uh, the best thing we saw, and this is still not quantitative. This is a ton electron microscopy TM, and these uh, darker re regions are depths and the lighter regions are elevations. And this is a 100 angstrom by 100 <coughs> angstrom patch on the surface. And if we take a line scan of that, what we got is this. We, this is the surface roughness now, but here is a depth. Here is a, presumably a pore. Again, there's a lot of argument whether that's a pore or not, or what we see. But if we take these two markers, and the distance between that is uh, 4.5 angstrom. So this is very really remarkable that direct experiments, indirect experiments, uh, all are in that range, giving us a size of five to six, five to seven angstrom, okay? But we definitely need a better way to scan this thing. And well, we have done uh, scanning, we have done small angle x-rays, we have small angle neutron scattering, uh, there's nothing. I mean, a very high-speed electron microscopy couldn't see anything. Uh, let me put it this way: If we told the, uh, the the fellow who is doing the experiment that we want to look six angstrom pores, he will find one. If we don't tell him, he doesn't find it. Okay. So that's the state of the art in this kind of a system, you know. Anyway, that's where we stand. If you have any better idea, please let me know. This is important. Our objective was to get the pore density, pore size distribution, and pore size. 
and we could not do that directly. But from direct and indirect, whatever we have, we concluded they're, they're in that range. It's not good enough. So this is a summary of this talk. We have produced this membrane successfully, and it, at this time, it looks very efficient for separating hydrogen hydrocarbon or hydrogen CO2 mixture. And ratio of pore size to molecular size is critical because that influences the selectivity and permeability. I'm not going to present this thing here today, but we have developed a whole bunch of molecular simulation ideas whereby we can demonstrate this, uh, this point much more clearly <coughs> from mathematics. And finally, this I just talked to you about, accurate measurement of pore size in this range is difficult, it's a challenge. I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Could, could you talk a little bit about the scale that this is being tested on now and what yes. would be commercial okay, size we of have, Okay, we started out about maybe a year back or a year and a half back with one foot long tubes. Tube, uh, okay. Yeah, with uh, the ID of six millimeter coated with this membrane. Then we went into a bundle of these tubes and the total area is about one square foot per bundle. And that's being tested in a refinery. What we're trying to make now is longer tubes and thousands of square feet. And that's, our, that's what we call our semi-commercial limit. And do, do you know on that scale if you have any problems maintaining the uniformity of the, the membrane? Uh, we have tested, no, no not, not so far we haven't seen it. It's very nice, so far, you never know. We have made those long tubes, many of them. They look pretty nice. We test them individually. That's a painstaking job, testing them individually at this time. Each one with a multi-component gas mixture. Keep in mind, we cannot predict that property from pure gases. So you have to do the exact multi-component gas mixture and test it for a certain period of time. It's, it's a lot of sweat going to do this, yes. Hmm. In the longer tube, does the C4 come out first right. and then as you go down right. the tube? Even in a foot tube, you see that. C4, depending on the flow rate, you can get a section where C4, not C4 pure, but maybe 98% C4 containing gas, then a C3 and then a C2. And as you go down, the selectivity changes, so they become more and more uh, less concentrated. You mentioned a low delta T or differential pressure across this membrane. What flux would that be at? It has to go depend on the flux, I would think. Right. No, but I'm saying that it depends on the adsorption isotherm too. If you have a strong, if you have a very steep adsorption isotherm, you can you can have a very small high pressure to low pressure difference, and yet have a large adsorption capacity difference. But do you have an idea of like a ratio of cubic feet? Well, we have used up to uh, so my units are on PSIG. Uh, for those applications, the lowest we have run is something like uh, 2.5 bar. Mm -hmm. Uh, even less, two bar, I think we have run pretty well. Uh, I'm sorry, not ratio, two bar on the high pressure side, one bar on the low pressure side. What, what surface area or what, what gas flow rate do you? Well, I have to get you into this. I don't recall all the details. But higher surface, I, I showed you a table, higher pressure you know, ratio also gives you better performance. Okay. But you think? Flux or the area required would be low enough to say not need a. Well, if you, if, if you assume, okay, that's a good point. If you assume that the, and, and typically the, these isotherms will be, these are Langmuirian isotherm, then beyond a certain pressure, you're not increasing your capacity anymore. I'm plotting amount adsorbed against pressure, and it's going up and then levels off. So beyond yeah. a certain point, you don't get any benefit of increasing the pressure because the amount adsorbed is not increasing. And that amount adsorbed is the driving force. So indefinitely increasing the pressure really doesn't help you. Now that has been another frustration with us. We could not, first of all, okay, this is a very interesting point. Which is, when we started this thing several years back, seriously, people will say, oh, this carbon is not going to stick on anything but another carbon because of the difference in the coefficient of thermal expansion. All right? That's why we started out the graphite support. But one day we said, let's put it on alumina. And it stuck like you won't believe. It really stuck there because this carbon goes a little bit into the pores of the 
thing and anchors itself. So all punditry was wrong. It's wonderful in graphite. We have put it on metal, porous metal solid. It sticks very well. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, we went from graphite to carb uh, alumina to we have tried other things like zirconia, etc., etc. Very interesting. Uh, how critical is, is the quality control of the polymer composition, and, and can you correct much for that by the uh, treatment conditions? Or? Some. Because, see, I did not, I, yeah, the, the, the starting polymer uh, density, etc. I have to be very, are very critical. This particle size distribution and all those things right. are quite critical. This temperature, I mean, heating, cooling rates, etc. are critical. And I did not mention one thing in the whole talk, that is, after making the carbon, we have a step called passivation. See, any nascent carbon will oxidize slowly in ambient air. We have a step where we pre-oxidize this thing with with something, with air, with air or ox well air or CO2 or steam. Now what happens is that if you put oxygen group on the surface, the pore goes down. So it's a straight off. You start with bigger right. and it goes down. There's a lot of art in it. <laughs> but so far we have been we have reproduced it hundreds and hundreds of times. So what are the tubes like? Are they actually alumina tubes? They're alumina tubes, 6 millimeter ID. I think it's about 2 or 3 millimeter thick. And uh, whatever length you want to make. And you calcine those at high temperatures and they won't crack? Very high temperatures you get the carbon form. Oh, what I was going to say, which I forgot, is that we try to scrape off this car. We don't have isotherms. That's another problem. Because putting it in an adsorption apparatus, the amount of carbon on this thing is negligible and it's a micron tape. So we can't measure the isotherms in a conventional apparatus. The weight of the substrate is so high that weight change is negligible. We try to scrape it off and it is very difficult to scrape it off. Okay? It really is there's you know and that's another problem. We haven't got an isotherm. If you have a way to do that, I'll be more than glad to hear about it. Uh, you had mentioned in the early part of your talk that some of the larger molecules can actually um, lead to the clogging of some of the um, less than 10 uh, Armstrong pores. And I was wondering, um, since it's you know, obviously expensive to produce those membranes, what is the regeneration capacity? And well, okay, um, have that's you a very important question. By the same argument, if you have a C7 or C8 or C9, that plugs off the membrane and completely block it off. So we need a guard bed of carbon prior to this membrane, which is built into the design to protect it from higher hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. uh, if that hydrocarbon gets into this thing, like we have tested C7 quite extensively. Beyond that, we haven't, it is difficult to produce that. You can burn them off at 400 or 500 degrees C, but that's not desirable. Mm -hmm. uh, C5, C6 will also damage it, but they're they can be regenerated easily, not C5, C6, by simply purging it with something. Mm -hmm. To need a guard bed, yes. Yeah. Would the heating process actually lead to the winding of the force? Not at that temperature. This, this, this thing has seen 800 degrees yeah. C or what have you. That's a good concern, though, because see, these things will be potted yeah. with a, some kind of a uh, sealant. That has to take this. So don't, you, we don't, at this time, we do not plan to hit this thing. Mm -hmm. You have just, uh, you have mentioned that the, 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 the type of the precursor can affect the separation performance. Uh, do, you, do you think uh, the functional group on the carbon, with carbon surface or the, or the surface of the channel can also affect the, the, the separation the selectivity of the adsorption? Uh, I'm saying again, I didn't fall. The surface function of wood. Oh, yes, very much so. See, when you do this passivation, you're introducing um, carbonyl groups, hydroxyl groups, you know, the peroxide groups, and depending on what you are putting on there, how you are, uh, how, how you are uh, passivating it, it makes it more polar, less polar, all kinds of stuff. Actually, and I cannot talk about it. We have got uh, that uh, mod has been doing this for the last couple of years of all one of this surface group molecular engineering, and we have some very interesting results for other separations. I, I, I won't talk about it. 
But in that connection, I presume you can juggle with the polymer formulation to give you different apertures for different separations. You can, but we have stuck with PBDC because with others we have found we cannot get that kind of narrow distribution. I don't know the reason. Hmm. For example, pen or uh, or uh, PFA will give you microporous carbon, but the distribution of pore size with those are nowhere near this kind of this okay. this uniformity. I, I don't know the answer. Although that's, you know, I will not rule out some other polymer which would be as good or better. So if you wanted a different size distribution for a different type of separation, you'd have to start from scratch. No, basically. what we do is we have learned this thing that we can burn off the carbon to make it bigger oh. or block it off with this group substitution. That we have learned very well. Right. That we have learned so you can well. tailor it? Yeah. Yes, okay. quite, a bit. quite a bit. The main thing is not so much... The main thing is to have a narrow distribution of pores. So if you have PPM level of pores of let's say 50 angstrom diameter, that's like a hole. You're not going to use this mechanism for that separation anymore. You just destroyed it. So it's very delicate from that point of view. And we are very lucky, I mean I must say there's a lot of serendipity here that after you know, mishandling this so badly, I mean we do mishandle this thing, we are getting similar or very narrow pore distribution. So there has been uh, luck in this. Interesting. Yes. Have you tried to embed a catalyst inside of the membrane? Um, not yet. Okay. Not yet. That this Coresas group has uh, not with this membrane, but the one that they have made, which is a molecular serving membrane. They have just published a couple of papers where they put do exactly what you said. So it becomes not only shapes, it's not quite shape selective, it is part selective. Like if, what they did is put a oxidation catalyst inside this carbon fiber, which has a pore size of maybe 3.5 angstrom, because it distinguishes between nitrogen and oxygen. And then they try to oxidize uh, cyclohexanol. And what they get, they get a very high selectivity, almost 99% selectivity of conversion from cyclohexanol to cyclohexanone. And, and they're claiming that only the OH group gets into that, into that hole and gets oxidized. I cannot. So it's very interesting. That's a good point. Yeah. Any other questions? Dr. Sir Carl, once again. Thank you very much.